Good evening. My name is Francisco Aragon, and I direct Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the Institute for Latino Studies here at Notre Dame. As I mentioned in the program, which you all should have a copy of, tonight's event is taking place on the cusp of a milestone. In about three months, Letras Latinas will begin officially celebrating its 20th anniversary. We have eight events scheduled throughout calendar year 2024. Two are on campus and two are in Washington, D.C., where Letras Latinas had a sustained presence between 2007 and 2020. We also have events slated to take place in Tucson, Arizona, Chicago, Illinois, Miami, Florida, and San Jose, California to round out the year. The details of this eight event celebration will soon be unveiled at Letras Latinas blog. I consider tonight's event a prologue for it involves two writers whose artistry I have been admiring for nearly two decades. In addition, from my vantage point, tonight's event hints at a transition of sorts. The two individuals who will be introducing our featured writers and who you can read about in the program represent a bright future for Latinx letters and, I would argue, what I hope will be a promising future for Letras Latinas itself. For this past summer, I myself crossed my own threshold of being at Notre Dame for 20 years as well. Throughout that time, Letras Latinas' bread and butter have been partnerships and collaborations both on and off campus. And so I'd like to step aside and invite you to hear about the campus unit we have partnered and collaborated with the most, the Graduate Creative Writing Program, a program of which I am an alum. Please join me in welcoming to the podium the current Director of Creative Writing, Roy Scranton. Well, on, uh, thank you, Francisco. Uh, on behalf of the Creative Writing Program, please let me say bienvenidos uh, and express how proud and honored we are to work with the Institute for Latino Studies and Letras Latinas to support this reading and all the other great programming they've got going on um, and have been doing, uh, including, I'll mention, a poetry reading on November 9th with the Ernest Sandine Poetry Prize winner, Vicky Vertiz, and a reading next spring with U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Limon. Uh, creative writing and Letras Latinas have been working, have been close collaborators for decades, as Francisco mentioned. Um, and as he mentioned, he's a graduate of our own program. Uh, we were very proud to, to count him among our alums, uh, alumni. Uh, and we're delighted to work together to nurture literary culture here on campus in Notre Dame and to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. And while it's true that sadly September is almost over, the events keep coming. Next week in DCO English Commons, Creative Writing will be hosting poet Victoria Maria Castells, author of The Rivers Are Inside Our Homes, winner of the Notre Dame Review Book Prize. And the following week, also in DCO Commons, we'll be teaming with the Environmental Humanities Initiative to host Molly Lynch, author of The Forbidden Territory of a Terrifying Woman, a cli-fi book unlike anything you've read. Finally, save the date, for our big event for the semester, the Kelly Community Reading Series with Sophia Samatar 
on November 15th. Sophia Samatar is the author of five books, including the award-winning epic fantasy, A Stranger in Alondria, and most recently, the memoir, The White Mosque. We'll be collaborating then with the St. Joseph County Public Main Branch, where she'll be reading, and we hope to see you there. Um, I'm just delighted to be part of this evening and part of this collaboration, ongoing collaboration with Letras Latinas. Um, and it's an important part of uh, creative writing and literary culture here on campus. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Sofia Villamil, uh, who will introduce Louis Vett Resto. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here with us today. I am Sofia Villamil, and I am a senior from San Juan, Puerto Rico, majoring in theology and Latino studies with a minor in Portuguese. I am also the undergraduate Letras Latinas associate and a contributing editor for the Letras Latinas blog. <clears throat> today, I feel immensely honored and grateful to be introducing a literary force to be reckoned with and a bold and powerful voice for contemporary Latin American poetry, Luivet Resto. Luivet was born in Aguas Buenas, Puerto Rico and raised in the Bronx. She is a first generation college graduate earning a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and an MFA from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She is a mother to three kids known as her revolutionaries a Cantomundo and Macondo Fellow, a Pushcart Prize nominee, the winner of the 2014 Patterson Poetry Prize Award for Literary Excellence, a professor and literary journal editor, and a board member of the nonprofit organization Women Who Submit, which supports women and non-binary writers. Needless to say, Luvette is a woman who gets stuff done. Her three full-length poetry collections, Ascension, Unfinished Portrait, and Living on Islands Not Found on Maps speak to this poet's radical authenticity, extraordinary wit, and masterful command of language, its musicality, and its ability to forge remembrance, celebration, and community. Irene Lara Silva, in her review of Luvet's stunning collection, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps, said that reading Luvet's work is like sitting down with her best women friends over coffee or wine, body loose, sharing stories of love and heartbreak, memory and family, pain and loss. Indeed, Luvet's poetry is a beautiful conversation with herself, with the places and people she holds close, and with all of us. Her work is electric, intimate, empowering, clever, refreshing, accessible, meaningful. Duvet's poetry is, simply put, magic on a page. So without further ado, here she is, the Boricua Wonder Woman of Poetics, Luivet Resto. Gracias, Sofia. Uh, my daughter's name is Sophia. So I only have one daughter and her name is Sophia. So this was meant to be. And you're wearing purple. So there's just so many things going on. Um, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, which I would want to copy of later. I'm gonna, I, 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 I want to take a quick photo really quickly. This is, this is what I want to do. ¿Qué pasó? Oh, you can't. Disculpa. So this is what I like to do. I want to document this real quick. Sorry. I'm not a Gen Z, but I like doing this. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Francisco Letras Latinas University of uh, Notre Dame University for the invitation. This has been an amazing experience. I get to read with Fred, uh, who I met many years ago, and so I'm just as, this has been an honor and overwhelming privilege to do this um, and to, to read with him. So I'm going to read <clears throat> uh, poems that actually Fred chose. Uh, so these are his. Uh, these are the poems that he asked me to read this evening, and so I will read them actually in sequential order from the, the first book that was published all the way to the most recent book. The title of this, um, by the way, just to give you a quick disclaimer, when I get really angry, the titles of my poems are really long. 
You'll know if I'm really angry when I wrote a poem, if you get to the title and it's like four lines, you're like, oh, she was really angry. And so you'll, you'll see a pattern probably. Uh, questions for the young woman representing Latinos, women, Puerto Ricans, and people of color. I wonder why in a room full of white intellectuals, when the topic becomes immigration, diversity in our schools, multiculturalism, the end of affirmative action, bilingual education, racial profiling, women in the Senate, they ask me, do I eat California table grapes? How do I pronounce my name? Why the Spanish alphabet has 30 letters? When are the peak travel times in Puerto Rico? Do I know Maria, Maria Rodriguez from the Bronx? How do I roll my R's? How good are my translation skills? When did I come to America? Was it hard getting a green card? When did I learn to speak English? Can I teach them a new phrase to impress their maid? Why is it that all eyes fall on me waiting for an answer to their questions? Thank you. This other one is called Translator, uh, and this was written in Hadley, Massachusetts in 2003. I sat at the registry of motor vehicles when three men no taller than five feet walked in, question marks spreading on their faces like a new disease no one could name. Their eyes strained to understand the English-only directions glued to the wall. Melodic intonations reminded me of my pueblo, Aguas Buenas. I didn't want to help. I didn't want to translate. I didn't want. Our eyes met as I hid my face behind the pages of Judith Ortiz Kofer's Latin Deli. But it was too late. Their eyes told me their story, working in the fields for $50 a week, picking tomatoes that ended up in the salads of four-star restaurants, coming home to the one room they all lived in, the last name they shared, Santisa. Eyes dark as my grandfather's, bronze skin like my grandmother's grandfather who she called El Indio. Lost like me when I was four in kindergarten, unable to understand the words coming out of Mrs. Farrell's mouth. I prayed for someone else's humanitarianism, but not my own. I wished for blonde hair, white skin, blue eyes, and an accentless face. I thought about the Ivy League diploma hanging on my living room wall and the naked walls of the Santisa brothers. I didn't want to help. I didn't want to translate. I didn't want. As I watched the brothers ask a stranger, habla espanol? Thank you. Um, so I moved to Los Angeles 20 years ago and discovered uh, something that we didn't really have in the Bronx, tacos. Um, now you go to the Bronx, there's tacos everywhere. It's, very, it's, a different, it's a different Bronx, actually. I grew up in the South Bronx. Now they call the South Bronx Sobro. Sobro, yeah, my heart hurts, hurts every time I hear that. I'm like, no, nah, man, it's just the South Bronx, man. It's just, there's no Sobro, there's no piano district. Stop calling it that. You know, they call it the piano district, district because pianos actually were made in the South Bronx. Uh, a lot of grand pianos were made there, and the factories are still there. You could still see it, but you know, obviously, no one's in there. But so, real estate brokers are pitching the South Bronx as uh, the piano district, and I'm like, no, man, it's still the South Bronx. It's still Kennedy Fried Chicken down the block. Not, it's not Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's Kennedy Fried Chicken. So, moving to uh, LA, I discovered. Uh, Tacos, right? And, and they're amazing. They're beautiful. I love them. Not just on Tuesdays. Not just on Tuesdays. Okay? That's, that's, a mis that's, that's, a, that's not correct. There's, you can have tacos any day. So, and I just want to just put this out here. So back in 2006, we were discussing immigration for the umpteenth time. And I, come, I stumbled across a, um, a newspaper article on, on my feed. And it said, uh, death to the taco stand. And, I, and you could still look this up. It's called Death to the Taco Stand. And that really called my attention. So I, click, I quickly clicked on it because I'm like, I love tacos. What do you mean? Death to the taco stand. And as soon as I read the article, this was really true. So everything in this poem is actually legit. Um, Gwinnett County, Georgia really truly believed that if they got rid of the taco stands and the taco trucks, then all the Mexicans would move out. This is literally what it said. If we got rid of the taco stands and we got rid of the taquerias and the, ta and, you know, and the taco trucks, the Mexicans would leave. And I found that to be so disturbing. And, and, and the, obviously, the article continued to write about other spaces that were really, uh, food spaces that were really pushing uh, forward a very, a very specific rhetoric of what it is to be American. So this is called No More Tacos in Gwinnett County, July 2006. When the last brown footsteps walked out of Garfield High School for the second time, Gwinnett County, Georgia, declared death to the taco stand. 
No more dollar corn tortillas satiating the appetites of housekeepers, gardeners, waiters, pitch pick, peach pickers, janitors, nannies, giving them all a five minute taste of Juarez. The tacos migrated to Philadelphia with hopes of finding a friendlier and hungrier crowd. Instead, they found picket lines with Philly cheesesteaks holding signs. A sub owner had followed Georgia with a sign of his own. This is America when ordering speak English. In the kitchen, Manuel and Juan diced peppers and onions in silence. Paranoia and sign making spread to the Midwest where a Butler County, Ohio jail had a sign pointed to it, illegal aliens here. The steel bars shivered because hunger for revolution and absolution only existed here. Thank you. And all of it is true. I highly recommend looking it up, it, all of that. Um, it's called Geno's in Philadelphia, if anybody knows it. Um, they actually had a, a sign that says, when you're in America, speak English when ordering. And they eventually took it down, but it wasn't until just honestly a couple of years ago. And that, that jail cell in Ohio really did have a sign that was illegal aliens here. So, yeah. Um, so this was another one of, uh, <laughs> so as my bio said, I'm the proud mother of three children. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a product of the 90s. Uh, so like, you know, I'm blasting to, to, you know, Tribe Called Quest, Dr. Dre, you know, in my car most of the time, um, as well as a Gran Combo, right, and Oro Solido and everything else. So I have these beautiful grown children now. One of them is a college freshman, not too far from here, Northwestern. And I'm still very marveled that I somehow get to take care of three people, <laughs> like when I can barely take care of myself. And so... This is where the poem comes from because I am someone's mom and all of this is true. And there's a little quick reference to Don LaFontaine. I don't know if anybody here knows who Don LaFontaine is. Anybody, the older folks? I don't want to call you out, but the older people, do you know who Don LaFontaine is? <laughs> the more seasoned people in the room, let me put it that way. The sazonados, do you know? Adobado, no? no. So Don LaFontaine was one of the... Uh, one of the basically one of the, the the two or three people that did movie voiceovers. So if you ever grew up in the 80s, 70s, or the 90s, and you went to the movies and you sat there for the trailer and it's, and you heard somebody go in a world of tomorrow, that was Don LaFontaine. And so there was two men and it was one woman actually for the longest time that did movie uh, voiceover trailers, and Don LaFontaine was one of them. So there is a brief reference to Don LaFontaine who passed away. Someone's mom, for my revolutionaries. In my mind, Don LaFontaine narrates the beginning of every morning. In a world full of dentist, dentist appointments, field trips, asses to wipe, lunches to pack, homework to sign, one woman's name echoes through Rocky Mountain laundry piles of Angry Bird underoos and Hello Kitty jeans. One woman answers to the call of mommy. A technicolor of communist color dresses, Yankee caps, Converse sneakers, and one faded I Hate People t-shirt proudly worn at PTA functions and children's museums occupy the closet where nothing pastel or animal print is welcomed. Morning dance breaks to the Beastie Boys are mandatory like syrup on blueberry pancakes with a bacon smile and whipped cream eyes. A mid-afternoon glass from my favorite bottle of wine in a sippy cup with the words, mommy juice, don't touch. Sound like a Dora the Explorer episode asking for things in two languages. Say darn when I stub my toe, but scream motherfucker when another parent cuts me off at the drop-off line. I pretend to change my name to Queen Sheba of the Desert, plugging my ears from three voices in a monsoon of questions. How I wish to respond, no, I don't know why ants are that small and who cares, they're ants. Forget them. Watch me take advantage of their size with this chancla. Darwinism at its best. On Columbus Day, I teach them about hubris, genocide, respect for the property of others. On New Year's Eve, write each of them a letter of the obstacles they conquered, new games they mastered, colors they discovered, the lines they stayed in, the boxes they thought out of, new lessons they learned in and out of the classroom, like opening the door for anyone or the power of listening, especially when a grandparent speaks. With each passing year in the surreal lands of Marques and Paz, I challenge patterns etched in the knots of our family tree, carve new ones in the extended branches with smiles instead of tears, hugs instead of raised hands and voices, break traditions of alcoholism and apathy with Lego hammers. Take them to bookstores, show them mommy's name on a spine so they know guidance counselors can be wrong and how anything is possible. 
you. Um, and my second to last one, uh, this one's dedicated to my tia, uh, Diana, who passed away at this point a decade ago, suddenly from an aneurysm, uh, a brain aneurysm. Uh, she's the only tia that I have, and her passing was really sudden for our family and was probably the first passing we really experienced. Um, and I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I was, I was in Texas, actually, at a poetry event. Uh, so this is dedicated to her. It's uh, Diana's Elegy for Diana Garcia. I never wanted to write you this kind of poem. I hope to write you an ode, praising the taste of your rellenos de papa that no one else can make without them crumbling into hands like chalk, or the way strangers confused us for mother and daughter in the summertime. In your eyes, I was always the precocious toddler, raising the volume of your stereo as you practice shorthand for the next secretary exam. The result of baby babble, tatan, was your name instead of tia or titi, an only child with only one tatan who cursed best in limited English. You taught me the best way to serve a volleyball, exchanged off-color Spanish jokes like a teenager, yelled my name across bodega aisles. I miss the last, de last decade of your life not knowing it would be the last, and funeral collages become memories I had forgotten. I never wanted to write you this kind of poem. I thought I would have more time to write you an ode. And uh, the last poem I'll read is actually the title of the last collection, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps. Um, and this is dedicated to anyone who is bilingual, whatever that may mean, or trilingual. I live on an island not found on maps, growing up in the shadows of one of the most popular surnames, Garcia. I speak Spanish to my abuela on Sundays, but rely on Google to help my children with their homework because the accent rules never stuck. Stress or unstress? Penultable syllable? Took the paradoxical college course, Spanish for bilinguals, where every Tuesday, Professor Cruz de Jesus would shake his head with indignation at my use of the familiar tú versus usted. No me conoce, he said. He was right. He didn't know me, and I didn't know him or the proper word for bus or orange juice. What I did know is summers in Puerto Rico, eating quenepas, as relatives ask, ¿No entiendes lo que dijo tu primo? And my abuela, defending my tongue, this tongue, colonized not once but twice, leaving me isolated at family reunions, feeling inadequate for my inability to conjugate on command sounding out storefront signs, signs while riding the number 42 bus on the way home from kindergarten, where I concentrated to understand Mrs. Farrell's lessons about the seasons. But I finally found a home between Bronx Bodega Isles, code switching with my homegirls about how many times Juana bipio that boy we saw standing in front of a building. This became the island where I belong, unfettered and absent of red pen corrections. Juana didn't care if I used the tú or the usted or if my yo was about me or an emphatic reaction to her crazy story. This island didn't care if I rolled my R's or ever got the purpose of vosotros. An island where our bodies translated feelings, pursed lips, a raised brow, an aggressive eye or neck roll. We were bilingual neologists, inventing new lands we could carry in our tims and our bubble coats. Here, language like us wasn't disappointing or broken. Gracias. Hello. My name is Laura Villarreal, and I'm going to be introducing Fred Arroyo. Fred Arroyo is a master of memory. Memory is flawed, often full of holes and doubts. But in Arroyo's hands, memory is a filament that he expertly weaves into lyrical narrative. His memories are vivid descriptions of place and time, but more importantly, emotional landscapes of loss and longing. He questions why the feeling of absence persists well after the initial act of leaving. He reckons with his place and displacement. With regard to memory, he eloquently writes in Sown in Earth, Essays of Memory and Belonging. I'll need to move backward and forward. I'll need to invent the past within the present, the present within the past, if I'm ever to come to terms with this memory. He also writes, memories don't arrive chronologically or voluntarily. 
They bloom one after the other like flowers in the spring, colorful and full one day from the dirt that still smells of winter, like spots of blood appearing on a tile floor when you don't even know you've been cut. I never have to search for them or call them forth. Memory is a topic he continues to reckon with from various angles. He approaches it through obsession and careful attention, understanding how nuanced and difficult it is to capture everything. In addition to this essay collection, he is also the author of a short story collection called Western Avenue and Other Fictions, and a novel called The Region of Lost Names. The characters from The Region of Lost Names cross over to continue their stories in Western Avenue. Both books illuminate the lives of working class Hispanic immigrants and migrants working in the Midwest. The line between nonfiction and fiction is thin in Arroyo's writing. His male characters are men like his father and those who worked in the green giant mushroom cannery in his youth. These characters reside in what Arroyo calls the region of lost names, where nicknames and work take the place of identity. He writes, like many of those Puerto Rican men of my father's generation, I could have simply become the dust in a region of lost names. So perhaps one impulse driving his work is the preservation and restoration of his father's life and the lives of men in the form of narrative, to not allow their lives to become invisible. Arroyo unearths personal histories and creates a fuller vision of their interconnected lives. These bridges between generations and geography allow us to see the labor and loss and longing behind products we consume. We learn that there is so much more to see if we turn an ethical attention to the world. At the moment, he is working on a book of poems called Immigrant Creek and Other Songs and a collection of short fictions called The Book of Manuel's. I was fortunate enough to get a sneak peek of his poetry manuscript and can confidently say it is one we will all be eager to buy. I look forward to reading his latest short story collection. Please join me in welcoming Fred Arroyo. Thank you, Laura. Laura. Talking about a stranger, but I really appreciate it. Beautiful introduction. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Letras Latinas. Thank you to the Creative Writing Department. Thank you all for attending. And thank you, Louis Vett, for that beautiful reading. Uh, Louis Vett picked some uh, passages for me to read from Sown in Earth. One from an essay, Ox in the Dusk, another one titled Grand Marais, and the other one, Next Country. She kind of, I like, really like what she picked. It's like a transitional state um, that moves from Puerto Rico and into my becoming a writer. So I don't think it needs much context. It's too much to try to, ex try to explain that. So I'll just pause between every little section and keep going. But uh, following your introduction, there is these things when um, I just call them the accidents of history. There wasn't a plan to become a writer. And there'll be a reference to a house, and it's, I made it all capital. It's called the Puerto Rican house. And the Puerto Rican house was demolished, but it was in a town not too far from here, Niles, Michigan. And accidentally, I grew up in the house across the street from it where there was all these Puerto Rican men who were sort of shipwrecked in that town who had come to work at Green Giant, and they would be there across the street at that house, my father as well. My father had traveled, my father and I, excuse me, had traveled together to his childhood island for a two-week visit. I remember I was nine years old. One night, he had taken me to a festival. The plaza was crowded with people and colorful lights for El Dia de los Tres Reyes. I had been to Puerto Rico before at the age of two, and as we walked in the plaza, many faces looked familiar. Each smell, roasting pork, wet banana leaves, hay, freshly cut coconut, was pleasant and comforting. My body beginning to sway to music I must have tried to dance to before I could even utter a sentence. The food stalls and amusement rides sparkled with light. 
and in the middle a fountain shot up small drops of water like fireflies. On a table under a canopy of canvas, masks with long pointed horns and noses grimaced in yellow, black, and red. There were machetes made of wood and painted maracas from dried gourds. In a miniature country house, there was a table with tiny pots, spoons, forks, knives, and cups arranged on top. Hanging from the rafters was a long bundle of green bananas, a mesh bag filled with oranges, and a freshly plucked chicken, its eyes shiny bits of glass, the rope around its still-feathered neck streaked with blood. At the next stall, heat lamps cast down their strong light on candied apples and pink cotton candy spinning like clouds, and white paper boats held saffron-tinted bacalitos, their crispy edges like delicate lace. I turned and my father was gone. He had already been walking unevenly, more sideways than straight, slurring his words, his eyes closing between steps. I walked and walked past the stalls, up and down the aisles, looked hard at the faces I passed, and circled around the fountain, only to discover I was lost. An older couple asked for my abuela. They each took a hand and led me through the plaza. A long line of cars snaked down the road before the turn to abuela's barrio. And there, in the passing headlights, abuela paced, her hands behind her back, looking at the approaching cars. She was waiting as if she knew something was wrong. I write these fleeting memories and continue to experience loss, wonder once again what I hope to accomplish besides feeling inadequate, small, trivial. I never had a chance to ask her about that memory, how it was that she knew to walk to the end of the road and wait. What vision did she possess? Had that couple called? Was it possible that my father got scared, gave up searching for me, and then found his way back home? Before I realized I needed to ask her, Abuela died. My stomach clenches, then releases something like water or blood or inner light, a wave of butterflies rising inside my chest. Images, smells, the taste of cilantro, the wet thud of breadfruit falling to the ground, an intuition to sit still, wait, just stay here without expectation. Let the butterflies gather. I see the white ox. He lifts his leg, his shoulder ripples, and he shakes his head, his tail whipping in the air. I move closer. The chain clinks. The bats swerve across the sky, the thick green of the mountains feeling close enough to touch. And the day runs faster toward night. The cane stalks, a stark bone white, their tops tinted purple. In the dusk, I touch his side, feel his hard shoulder, hear Abuela calling for me to come back home. There were so many people who wanted to be writers, but there was nothing more difficult than writing the poet Jim Harrison told me, and he doubted writing could be taught. A person who wanted to write better make sure it was necessary on a spiritual, emotional level because it was such a hard thing to do. He had read through my manuscripts and liked best the story that began with my grandmother cooking in her kitchen. He wrote that my prose showed promise, but it was up to me to figure out what I wanted to do with it. I felt that he left me with a line to continue working with, a tricky way of saying something unnecessary will not do, words I recognized from his poem in Interim's Outlier. And I added these as well, clear your speech, it is all that we have, aloud and here and now. He made it clear that he could be of no help and thus he didn't want to hear from me again. The letter that he sent me shook in my hands. 
Inside, my stomach and chest trembled. I had received some praise from teachers and student writers. I had never published a word. For years, I had been called stupid, though, belittled, had lived in apartments and houses that roared with my father's verbal and physical rage. Since the age of 14, I'd worked seasonal and full-time jobs, and for the last five years, had worked in a factory. Writing was a happy accident, a discovery I had no control over. I was too close to beginning to say it was saving my life. There was nothing in my life worth saving. But in that moment, trembling in front of the mailboxes, trying to steady my hands, I read the letter again and shook with new emotions, with the power of words. For months, I walked around with a question. What's promise? What's my promise? There are some things you cannot share with others, even your closest friends. There are secrets you must struggle with. My upbringing, being a first generation college student, and my work were experiences I couldn't easily confess. I couldn't envision how my past was relevant to my learning, writing, and life. I had never had any guidance about such things and I felt I had to hide who I had been in order to make the leap into a college education. To get me through this period of intense self-doubt, I suppose I needed the help of an experienced and mature writer someone who could help me to see the value of my words, someone who could encourage my writing, someone who wouldn't allow me to make excuses. Patricia Henley became that someone. As my mentor, she filled my days with possibilities for reading and writing, and she challenged me to do whatever it took to live a writing life. Patricia began each class by reading a writer's words or an anecdote of biography from a daily calendar. And this small act provided a glimpse into the unstoppable history and life of the written word. In workshops, she read from a story, a passage, a few sentences to illustrate an important element of craft for the specific day. She introduced me to writers like Raymond Carver, Andre Dubois, Richard Ford, and Catherine Ann Porter. It meant the world to, to encounter writers who were grappling with the burden of family, class, and work. I sensed authority and authenticity in each of the writers Patricia introduced. They too struggled with place and identity, and in ways I wanted to understand. Catherine Ann Porter, for example, wrote beautiful, detailed, and compelling stories set in Mexico, which she described as her much-loved second country. Porter was but one of the writers who helped me to think about writing in exciting and new ways. She sparked connections and metaphors across borders and countries, so I could begin to remember and imagine how my childhood, in the shadows of the Puerto Rican house, contained a second country I would learn to love, a second country I needed to write into existence. Back then, I was a sponge and a songbird. I took in everything I read and held it close. I was exploring, learning, practicing, and the best way to begin as a writer is by playing another writer's music. Patricia listened carefully and she heard my emerging style and voice, my music. She read every manuscript I gave to her, too many to count, too many I should have held on to. My lyricism was often unbounded, which led me to write long, complex sentences. When I enrolled in college at the age of 23, I struggled with English proficiency and grammar. I never felt that Patricia saw these as a problem. Instead, she helped me hone my skills so that my sentences possessed more elegance, grace, and power. I can still recall how much creativity I gathered as Patricia took me through the use of M dashes and semicolons, both of us hunched over the sentences of Alice Munro, Richard Ford, and William Trevor. 
Through this kind of reading and writing, she taught me the joys of the craft, the solitary pleasures of exploring the life of a sentence, and the sea change you experience when you are able to identify and touch in your mind what Raymond Carver called a writer's unmistakable signature. She affirmed my love for words, reminded me why I love to work with them and how a love for words is not enough to become a writer. Recently, Patricia wrote in a letter, you were on my mind this morning because I find that I'm starting my novel all over again. You stand out as a writer who is always willing to do that. There's no way around it. This is weird, I haven't read this in a long time. Most of my days of late lack purpose. They don't burn with the lyricism, passion, and magic that used to propel me into writing. I'm digging deeper into that old secret, into who I was and how it is that I became a writer who has one foot in the North Country and one foot in the Caribbean, a writer caught between two much loved countries. In writing these essays and memoirs, I've lost the mask of my invented characters and narrators, and to stare at the blank page without them is a great challenge of emotion, vision, and language. I find that the past is filled with too much loss, too many wasted years, a younger self I cannot save. I write images and memories that flounder in a turbulent sea, too often, the pieces I write seem fitful, false, freighted by effort. It's as if my many years of writing have been a lie because I can't seem to trust the process, can't trust that the writing itself is the way. I question every decision, write pages that seem worthless. I know I have a story to share, but then there's always this other voice asking, who really cares about that story? Thank you. So now we're going to hear uh, Fred and Louisette have a conversation. Notes. There are always no notes. Yeah, no, you don't need notes. Right. Can I ask the first question? Andale. <laughs> um, this seems very loud. We OK? Yeah? Um, well, it was your last poem, um, f the title poem from the book, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps. I really admire that poem. Um, and it's interesting because we've been, it already came up again tonight, but obsession, and we've been talking about origin stories and today. But in that poem, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps, from your most recent book, um, it's still a poem where there is the presence of names, accent, education, language, colonialism, home, and belonging, a thread that's present in each of your books. Have you thought about how or why these conflicts and possibilities won't leave you alone? And perhaps the importance of accepting them as gifts or obsessions that must be expressed, turned into art? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, never thought them as, I never thought of them as gifts, so that's really, when I read that question you know, a couple weeks ago, I, I, that was definitely an interesting way of looking at it. Um, I do think it's an obsession, right? Because I think for me, language, um, even to this day, is, and I go back to being a parent really quickly, is, is that now that I have the, the, the teenagers, what I'm hearing from them these days is their struggle with language. Uh, you know, I'm getting <laughs> politely blamed, shall we say, because there are no Sabo kids. They consider themselves no sabo kids. For people who know those no sabo kids, right? We have, a, you know, some people are shaking their heads like, "Yeah, I'm a no sabo kid," right? So I have three of them at home apparently, and they're blaming me. They're like, "Ah, it's your fault that we don't know." And I'm like, "That's nonsense. I spoke to you in Spanish quite often. You only need the word leche for like the longest time. You didn't know that was called milk, like you know." So, but 
you know, now that they're, you know, they're older and they're able to articulate themselves and, you know, exert their independence, shall we say, they really do kind of, uh, we've, we've been having this dialogue over the last few months or even a year now about language and the Spanish language in, in particular. Uh, my oldest is now just taking Italian and he's also taking Spanish, but he also struggles with conversation in Spanish. And that's really his thing. Like he's developed this, shall we say, complejo, uh, where he doesn't feel comfortable talking to other Spanish-speaking people um, because he, his voice actually changes. He actually get his, um, how do you say it in English almost? Um, he just softens his, his, his volume because he's nervous that he's not saying it correctly. Even though he took AP Spanish Lit, he's an intense something, he's gonna get placed out in the next couple of months, but he just doesn't feel comfortable with having conversations. My daughter feels a little bit more comfortable and she's, you know, but she just dropped Spanish the other day because they made her take Span like Spanish, Spanish, like learning about Spain. She's like, nah, fuck that. <laughs> she told me like, why am I want to watch? She's like, why do I want to watch videos about people colonizing my people? Like, I'm good. Like, I know y'all colonized me. I don't need to see this again. I was like, okay. <laughs> She's like, I'm gonna go take uh, government, and I'm like, all right. And then my youngest is taking Mandarin. So, uh, you know, language in my household right now is an interesting topic, and I think that there's gonna be some new poems coming out of in the next couple of years because of these intense conversations of, 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 you know, regarding language period and Spanish language, and also colonialism, right? We have those very frank conversations as well. So I don't know, I don't, I, there is an obsession, I think it's a good word. I don't know, I, I'm gonna try to really think about them as gifts now, uh, because I think I also struggle with the Spanish language. Uh, when I speak to my mother on the phone, I speak to her in English and in Spanish, and, and there's certain words that I just can't, I just, it don't, they don't come to me in, in, in Spanish very well. I struggle with certain words in Spanish and I always will mispronounce them or not conjugate them right. And you know, she politely me correct, you know, she'll correct me. And, or even at work, I, I teach uh, you know, at a middle school and I'm really good friends with a Spanish teacher who's from España, right? And then I have a coworker who's Chicana and we all speak different Spanish. Uh, and the other teacher is a uh, Colombiana Ecuadorian. So we all speak different versions of Spanish that, uh, you know, when we're all together, but they don't seem to understand me. You know, like the, the, like the bus came to pick up the kids for a field trip. I'm like, ay, la guagua está aquí. And everybody's like, what is she saying? And I'm like, la guagua, la guagua está aquí, el chofer, and they're like, and then finally somebody was like, oh, I think she means bus. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, that's right, autobus. <laughs> but Puerto Ricanos, we call it guagua. Nice. And that doesn't really meet any, mean anything to other Spanish-speaking people. So that was a very, like, very esoteric word for, 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 for me and for us. And so yeah, I don't know. I, think it's, it's, I don't think I'm ever going to not write about language because I'm very proud to be bilingual, um, even though I struggle sometimes. And now, I, now having these conversations with my children about their relationship and their complicated relationship with Spanish, and, and I feel you know, bad that I potentially failed them in some way, even though I don't think I did, but you know, they, they tell me, you failed us. <laughs> so, I, I, and just hearing their, their complexities with it, um, you know, it's, it's a different perspective now, now that I'm, I'm, I'm a grown up and, and taking care of these people and like getting into these conversations. So maybe some new, new poems will come through. I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question. But. There you go. Uh, my turn. Um, so, in in the essay uh, in the in the book in eighty five Reed Avenue, there are two lines that stood out to me. We had no we had no books in our house on Reed Avenue, and sometimes the library would show short films, um, and that's like on page thirteen if you have his book with you. Growing up in a household absent of literature, the library and school seemed to be a refuge, infusing you with joy and love, exposing you to journeys and adventures. I read that part as prophetic to the trajectory of your career. How influential would you say those library visits were for you as a storyteller? And do you see the irony of having not lived in a home with books, but yet here we are? Uh, first, the last part, yeah, I do see the um, the irony of that, or the, my fate in that, to follow through with what you're writing. Um, Jorge, Jorge Luis Borges has this line that 
um, I never had to stray from my father's library because that was the, the most important library that there was. Um, and a lot of those books, if I'm correct, were in English. Um, and I just saw that and I was like, wow, what a great life that was if your father had a library like that. So I just started to see, but my father is a library. He's a walking library, but it's a different library. And starting to see that, that you don't always have to be in the stack, you don't have to be in musty old books, the big ones, trying to figure things out that there are texts all apart and stories are all a part of our lives, but we have to figure out where we're gonna accept them from. So, um, yeah, that was important. I think, too, that um, being the son of an alcoholic, uh, everything was very interior and alone, so it created a lot of solitude. It was like a Saturday afternoon was 100 years of solitude. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's very much in my memory, the mindset of a little boy that was me sitting at a giant, gleaming wood table in this little white library on New Britain Avenue and taking out um, the Encyclopedia A and reading stuff about aardvarks and Argentina and an asp and just like being engrossed there all alone doing that like for a whole afternoon. And it was like free babysitting. My mother was out probably doing stuff she needed to do because she had to work all week. Um, but it replicated that solitariness and um, Laura wrote, a, you know, talked about inventing memory in the present, taking the present and the past. I mean, yeah, the libraries became important because I can look back and see that little boy and say, that's the little boy, you know, on the cover of this book that became a person who now sits at desks like that and writes, uh, who spends a lot of time <laughs> in libraries. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, that was fundamental. And I connected to that because I grew up in libraries too. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. So I understood that. And in both of our, both of these first two questions, I mean, I know we have a lot of questions, but we are having a conversation. It is to, I think, um, part of what you were saying and maybe part of what I'm saying is we often forget that language is, uh, has a life of its own and it's always living. It's always changing. Um, but if we get stuck and we don't think about that, then we you know, can't see, no, my kids are giving me something, you know, they're telling me something, mm -hmm. and there's something that they want about it, but it, and it's particular to them now, which is different than my experience. Yeah, absolutely, because they grew up in a household, again, you mentioned I'm first generation, so I grew up in a household that was only Espanol, right? And and it was, I was, very, there was, in my household, it was very particular. It's like, yeah, you can go to school and it's going to be in English, but the second you come home and it's Espanol, like you're going to start speaking Spanish here. And so, and just being completely, you know, surrounded by, you know, Univision, Walter Mercado, telenovelas, like that's what I grew up with, right? Primer Impacto, and you know, um, Cristina, who did not watch Cristina, right? Um, she was the Sally Jesse Raphael of of, of, uh, <laughs> of Latino television for us. So I grew up really differently than they did. So my relationship with language was that, um, and then they obviously they grew up with myself and, and their father who is fourth generation. So his, so he doesn't, he's, he's considered pocho, right? He'll say yo soy pocho. Uh, his Spanish, he'll say yo soy pocho, you know? And, and so I can understand why they have a relationship now that they do a language because they grew up with two different parents, right? One who didn't speak a whole lot of Spanish and you know, he would consider it not the best. And then I would speak more, but still, growing up in America and growing up in California and knowing that they were going to English only schools. We didn't do the dual immersion program. They didn't have those readily available for them. So it was just different. And they took Spanish in elementary school and they took Spanish, at least the older two took Spanish in high school. So again, they pursued it. But like I said, the, the, the youngest one signed up for Mandarin and he's thriving. He's doing amazingly well. Like he can have great conversations in Mandarin. Um, so, you know, I'm happy for them that they could be bilingual or trilingual now, or potentially. Uh, but, you know, I, I can I can sense the resentment almost when we have those conversations recently of like, you know, that they don't have this mastery, and I try to remind them like I don't have that mastery either. Trust me, like I speak, you know, broken Spanish all the time. You know, so yeah, I understand that a lot. 
Um, and you, uh, the second to last poem that you read for your Tia, mm -hmm. Diana Garcia, mm -hmm. um, I use that word gift again. I think one of the most moving gifts in your poetry is the importance of los antepasados, which is in a way kind of what we're talking about. And I find a lot of American poetry is rather dry. Sometimes I think of it as kind of dead and hmm. that it seems too worried about creating something unique or seems to draw a line in the sand or cross time to support some aesthetic or school of poetry. So I'm reminded of the line that you picked out that I read by Jim Harrison, a tricky way of saying something unnecessary will not do. Right. Your poetry accepts the gifts of those before that are part of a poetic map still unfolding. And I especially admire how you connect the past with the future. So in the poem, for another example, Someone's Mom, <laughs> the speaker expresses how she'll take her children to bookstores, show them mommy's name on the spine so they know guidance counselors can be wrong and how anything is possible. That was a great, I'm really glad to hear you read that. Exploring, knowing, and accepting, and creating from the past then has living consequences for the future. Could you talk about the importance of accepting or claiming a poetic family for your writing? Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I think for me, I, I going back to what you the, the line you mentioned from um, from Jim's line about the tricky part. I'm remembering from my mentor, Martin. Martina Spada was my mentor in, in, in graduate school, and to this day, we're still really good friends. He mentioned something really similar uh, in the sense of writing about, um, re regarding the sonnet. He said, you know, look, if you're gonna, <laughs> he was pretty transparent, he's like, look, if you're gonna write a sonnet, okay, it's gotta be really fucking amazing at this point. You know, everyone's done the sonnet. You know, and Neruda did it, you know, he wrote a hundred sonnets, you know, for his second wife, right, um, Matilda, right? Like he wrote a hundred sonnets for this woman. If you didn't get a chance to read his work, it is amazing. And I am always like taken aback that he wrote a hundred ways of loving her and they're each unique. And they don't ever feel that they, in my opinion, they never get repetitive, right? And that, that's just, again, amazing. So he told me, he's like, if you're gonna do this, if you're gonna write a love poem and it's gonna be a sonnet, you, you know, it's been done. So if it, it has to be something completely brand new, it has to be innovative because it's been done. Like the same thing with, you know, if you write about death, if you write about nature, obviously all that stuff has been done. So if, you go, if you're going to go there, it has to be then almost again brand new for someone. Like you have to almost be revelatory for someone. So that stuck with me and that resonated with me in that line because it's like what we're doing is not, it's not brand new. Right, we're not we're not we're not the first poets ever to do this, but w how we're doing it is different, and and it is kind of innovative, right? For for what we do, for who we're, who our audience is, you know, audiences could be. Um, so I think about that about poetry and like, okay, how what what am I doing differently with this, right? If I'm going to write about love, which has been done, obviously, and done well by other people that I respect, like Neruda and like even my theme too. What am I contributing to this um, that is going to be different? Um, and then regarding like poetic family and antipasados and, and even that line from someone's mom, uh, that was intentional because again, like, you know, I don't, again, I don't know how many people in the room can understand this, but like growing up, you know, in a certain time period where you had to take like a survey on what your career was gonna be. I don't know if everybody had to do that ever. And you get like a hundred questions or something like that. And then you get like a printout afterwards, like I did at least, like a very like, like one of those old timey ones, like they had a roll, right? And then you had to perforate, like that's how old the printer was. And I answered like a hundred something questions in high school, we all did for guidance, counselor for guidance class. And like funeral director, I swear to God, funeral director was on there. <laughs> I was like, how, how did my answers <laughs> come up to funeral director? I thought that was, I thought that was crazy. Uh, but that always stuck with me, how funeral director was one of the top five potential careers out of here. I'm like, all right, good to know. I hate cadavers. I just get I have no interest in the medical field, but okay, <laughs> sure. And that's why I wrote that too, right? Because I was like, they can be wrong. 
And I want my kids to remember that, that you know what, somebody could tell you that this is what your life is supposed to be like based upon these questions or based upon th these grades, and they can be wrong. Because look at me, they were wrong. I'm not a funeral director, just in case you want to know. I'm not moonlighting somewhere in the weekends as, as a funeral director anytime soon. So it's like all those guidance counselors who told me that this is what you're supposed to be based upon your straight A's and based upon this and that or the other or your personality profile, they were actually inaccurate because I went a completely different direction. And I want that to always be reminded to them that there's a possibility. You don't have to be cemented onto this path. You can always change paths, no matter how old you are. Um, so that's kind of where that part comes from. But poetic family, I think about the people that I lean on on a regular basis, if that's to answer your question, poetic family. Um, and is I, I really lean on, I was talking earlier, Dorothy Parker is one of my favorites, uh, absolutely, hands down. Love Dorothy Parker. Um, and I reread her work on, a, you know, as, as much as I can. I have all her first collections and stuff, but definitely Poetic Family. I would add her to my Poetic Family. I lean on her a lot because of her wit and what she represented in the time that she was writing. Who she was, surrounded by a world of men. She was one of the very few females to actually still be thriving and surviving and writing in her own path in her own way and, and not being apologetic about it. Like that. You know, that's that's what I that's 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 the that's the stuff I really feed off of, and I you know and I think it comes through my work, right? Voice. right. And so, she is part of the, my poetic family, and and even knowing about her own personal life too, I connected to her personal life when I did more more research about her too. I was like, oh, I get this, on so many levels. So, hopefully, that answers your question. Um, in the essay, uh, it's a very short essay, but I, I really liked it. Um, and again, it really resonated with me too. How My Father Taught Me to Write. Um, it's one of the shortest essays in the collection, but through it, throughout it, there is a motif, at least I saw, of red and blue lines. Um, it made me think of, what, of, the, of the Puerto Rican and American flag and how those two identities exist in your writing. There has always been the duality for us as Boricuas. We're neither here nor there. Um, how has writing this collection helped with reconciling that binary for you? Well, it helped me to map it, you know. <laughs> um, but the map for me is, uh, first of all, the essay that Louis Vett is referring to, How My Father Taught Me to Write. I was born in Michigan but only because he came to Michigan to work at a mushroom cannery. And then right after that, we went to Chicago for a little bit, but then Hartford, Connecticut, which has a little Puerto Rico there. Um, and he went there, and he worked at the Roy Type typewriter factory. And he would bring home in his lunchbox the, uh, the, the spools for typing. We didn't own a typewriter. He only, part of this, he only has a third grade education. But he would bring these spools home, and I would play with them, the typewriter ribbons. And they were black and red. And I would wet pencils and try to get the ink to work, wrap GI Joes in them, <laughs> make roads. And that's, you know, um, it became a metaphor for like, how do you write about, how do you write like something that's already overwritten that isn't giving you voice or anything? Um, so for me, when I say map it out, is that you're right, it's, it's a struggle because I grew up in that urban area and everything was in Spanish. And every summer, because it's so hot in Puerto Rico, my grandparents would come to Connecticut. And so I got to know them really well. And our house was a little bit like in a suburb with a little country. So everyone would come to the city and we'd make all this food and it was a party. But then all that got out of control with his drinking. And my mother, who's not a Puerto Rican, said, let's go back to my family in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So then we went back to Michigan, and his drinking got really bad, but he just became totally silent. And it was like a knife cut the Spanish language off because it was gone, mm -hmm. you know? He wouldn't talk. The family wasn't really around. So every, and you're getting taught everything in English, and then people are butchering your name and looking at you. Uh, Right, like this week, when I was in, uh, went to my first school, I was really ahead in school, but I was in fourth grade. I was like reading at a sixth grade, seventh grade level, but I was in fourth grade.
But the first day, a speech pathologist was at the door because there was no bilingual education. So they assumed that I was a migrant kid and the speech pathologist made me do my ABCs and say some numbers because <laughs> they wanted to make sure that I could speak English. That just like really, that memory just has waited on me forever. You know, I wonder if that's part of why I became a writer. Mm -hmm. So I have both of those as kind of Midwestern, small town, rural background, but then I also have that urban one and they're divided and it's a clash. But then there was always Puerto Rico too. So that's what I mean, like a map. It's like a really a triangle. And so in all my work, I'm always moving between that triangle, I think, trying to capture those different regions and some of those conflicts that you're bringing up. Okay. Two minutes? Okay. Oh, well, I'll go, you know, uh, I'll go back to the poem that I was just talking about a minute ago, which is Diana's Elegy. Mm -hmm. um, and it relates to you talking about making something new following Martine. It's a moving poem, and part of the reason it is is because it's also a prose poem. So in your recent, because I love prose poems, and uh, in your most recent book, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps, you write a lot of wonderful prose poems. And it seems like a continuity of the stories, portraits, and myths that have been a part of your poetry from the beginning. How did you, or why did you, how did you come upon the prose poem, or why did you decide to start writing prose poems? Because my editor told me to. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> why did he say that, or um, she do that? Why did he, you know what, I don't know. Uh, this is, no, really, this is true. So I gave him the manuscript, and uh, I said, any notes? And he said, yeah, this is great. I just think some of these poems could be prose poems. And I'm like, great. Which ones? And he's like, I don't know. You figure it out. And I was just like, you know, well, this is not helpful. Um, so I actually gave the manuscript to another writer that I know, and I mentioned this earlier in the interview about like actually be, you know, establishing your community. I gave my collection to another poet that I know that I respect, who's a great editor and writer, but he's also, I think, one of the most amazing pros, you know, uh, uh, poets and that I personally knew or know and I said hey do me a favor if you can can you read my collection um, the editor said that some of these poems can be prose poems I don't know which ones you know he didn't give me much uh, direction if you can potentially guide me here that'd be great take as much time as you need I, there's no rush right we were still in the pandemic this book is not going to come out anytime soon and he's like okay no problem and you know he came back about four or five months later and he goes here 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 and he gave me about eight poems and eight suggestions with line breaks and things like that. And um, I chose five of them or something like that. Whatever he was, I didn't go with every single one. But because of that exercise with him, you know, for long distance, it really helped me out. And then I ended up writing, I had time to write some new poems for the manuscript. I was like, oh, you know, I got time. So then I wrote some new poems and then they ended up becoming prose poems. So the grammar, so the grammar, uh, you know, intimate grammar rule was it actually one of the last minute poems to go into the manuscript, and I actually intentionally wrote that as a prose poem. Mm. But that's because we did this exercise, you know, uh, you know, long distance uh, with this other poet. But I, it's completely by chance, and now I started writing prose poems over the last like couple of years now. Now I'm like, now that I get the hang of it, now that I understand it, I was always really scared about prose poems. I was like, oh, it, it's it's like because it looks like a poem, but it's not. You know, it's kind of weird. Is it flash fiction? I don't know. You know, it's like this nebulous thing, and and to, you got to be really good at it. So, uh, I was really nervous about getting delving into that. Um, but yeah, I saw that question that you had, and I kind of laughed when I saw it because I was like, yeah, that was completely by chance. So, but yeah. Do you want to do I'll, I'll, try, I'll try six. Okay. It might be seven, but I'll do it. Yeah. Right. I'm next. Yes. <laughs> Fred's going to share a couple of new pieces, followed by Louis Vett, and then some questions. That's okay. We're writers, so we can improvise. <laughs> Let me get my papers up. I um, 
prepared 12, but I can do shorter. So um, I, I, writing two, I was writing two manuscripts at the same time, which would hopefully become two books. One was a book of poems, Immigrant Creek and Other Songs, and this other book of short fictions called The Book of Manuel's. I finished the poems first. Um, I was doing them simultaneously. And so now I'm working on the stories. So I'm going to read you one poem from Immigrant Creek and other songs, and then a very, very short, short story. Oh, you guys don't want to hear one poem? Oh, thank you for coming. Have a good night. This poem is called Alba Blanca, uh, White Dawn. My father hardly ever said a word to me. He held his language, his family, his lovely garden so close to his rolled up sleeves, so tight within his fists that words, I thought, must be terrible, so painful. He never wanted to mouth them, only wanted to strike them, never wanted to release them like the white butterflies fluttering between his pumpkin blossoms and green rosemary, never wanted to inflict them like the leather strap he took from a rusty nail on a post in the kitchen to quiet my questions, my eager and loud talking, my childhood singing. Later in a dream, I found my father sitting on a wrought iron bench in the park of pigeons. There was a blue fountain pen, the nib a shiny fine gold, a note card streaked with pigeon shit, the words elegant, illegible purple lines like waves searching for a shore, the shadows of palms tiger striping his open hands, his thighs, the freshly picked tomatoes ripening in a circle in front of his shoes powdered with red dust. Decades passed. There was no time left to blame or forgive. I love the smell of old leather his brown face streaked with salt, waves. He wiped his eyes, opened his mouth. We both looked to the sky as the pigeons sprang up and whirled in the alabaster light. This is, so this is a little short story, three pages, almost three pages. I write a lot of short, short, short stories called Stand Still in the Air Like a Hummingbird. And it is written from a writer who is from Indiana and writes almost everything in Indiana, and his name is Michael Martone. M told me the story of his grandfather's hog oiler. We were in my hospital room. M had opened the shades, the leaves of the willow oaks glinting with bright sun. The last time I had seen him, we were sitting at a picnic table looking out on M's garden, amazed by how obscene it seemed with its blues and yellows of late spring. The fuchsia foxglove was the star and bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds would soon follow, M had said. Now he was telling me about the oiler, and I didn't follow along because as he described his grandfather's hogs, I remembered Birch Pond. Late spring to early summer, I'd go there and rent a John boat from a man who lived in a small blue house. He had half a dozen boats at the most painted the same blue as his house. When I pulled up, the man wheeled his way to the shore, both of his legs amputated just above his knees. He wore dark navy pants held up by red suspenders, the extra leg material pinned up at his thighs, and a white short-sleeved Oxford shirt. He easily bent over and picked up a pair of oars, took my money, and handed them to me. Under the shade of an ancient cottonwood, a cool circle over his house, the shore, the boats were turned upside down on the green-blue grass. I'd flip a boat over, lay in the oars, and then return to my car for my poles and my bait. I'd row out on the pond, and it seemed like I was the only one who rented a boat for the pittance of $4 for the day. Away from the shade, the air seemed to change, and I could smell the distant hog farms and Jones, that earthy, sharp smell of thick mud, dead leaves, and the weight of those Michigan winters that never seemed to wane. 
At twilight, it was eerie to hear the hogs rooting and snorting, and their voices seemed close, just on the other side of the pond, an echoing roar like ferocious monsters or dragons from some dense forest. On one of the best days of fishing, I rowed the boat to the shore, turned it upside down on the grass, and along with my gear, I had a bucket of some 20 bluegills and crappies, about the size of my hand. The time to clean them was worth it. The fish were delicious rolled in cornmeal and deep fried until crispy. When I had left Birch Pond that evening, the old man, sitting inside by a window, raised his hand as I walked to my car. Last week, they removed half my right leg. Much earlier, I felt the cut on the horizon. My uncle lost both of his le legs piece after piece over time until he died of diabetes with basically just his hips left. I had some years before I arrived at that state. There was a time when I thought my sugars would never catch me. My son was maybe seven. We went up to International Falls and stayed at a small camp on Lake of the Woods. We camped along the shore, but spent most of our time in the back channel with the piers and the dock boats. My son could fish the whole day out there, casting to the edge of the lily pads along the channel. One afternoon, he caught at least a dozen fine lake perch, and he seemed so happy. That evening, I cleaned them, and I paid $9 for the cook in the camp lodge to batter and fry them and add them to a plate of fries and coleslaw. My son ate the whole plate. On the other side of the dining room window that looked out on the lake, green hummingbirds balanced in the air, their white and ruby throats pulsing as they drank from the feeder hanging from the roof's edge. My son never stopped smiling. M had finished his hog oiler story. How's the pain, he asked. Many don't know that hogs can get skin infections and the oiler was invented so they could rub their snouts, shoulders, and backs along the oiler, the oil rising from the drum as they rub to help take away some of the itch and pain, help to heal the hog's skin. Hogs often suffer from sunburn. Those many silver sideways seas out in the pastures are not cruel huts where the hogs live, but they do serve as an oasis from the burning sun. The oilers help to soothe too. It's okay, I said, not bad at all. The nurse had told me I might experience phantom pain, what she called the sequela of amputation. I thought of the sequel of my lost leg story, the story of my leg's pain and being lost, wanting to return, wanting to still be a part of my moving body. The sequel was not complete. The moving will continue. I had to believe. I lifted my left leg to experience what was still with me. My only phantoms, these memories, never lost in my mind, as long as I followed them to where they needed to go. M was trying, I know, to help me with his hog oiler story because that was what he always done with the stories he shared. What he had, what he had always done with the stories he shared, excuse me. He smiled, touched my forearm. He was helping. Thank you, I said. The window in my room was filled with shadows. My son had recently sent me a postcard from Big Sur, wrote of how he visited the Henry Miller Library and how he couldn't express the ocean and the tall jagged and round rocks, the winding road, how the forest never seemed to end. He included a passage by Miller about a hummingbird's balanced stillness. That helped too. I handed the postcard to M. I didn't want to bother my son's new life on the bay. I'd tell him what happened later. Em and I looked at the bridge arching over Bigsby Creek, the Pacific's cresting white waves visible under the moon, and I hoped Em heard the ocean roar too. 
And as I stared into the cathedral of trees, the wind swaying their tops until they rubbed together, maybe like me, he couldn't tell one from the other. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Fred. OK, so I just have like four poems, and then um, I love food. Sorry, I told you about tacos, right? So this is about my next favorite food. Romantic arguments, colon, the pizza. I want to argue past midnight, Chicago versus New York style. You'd politic for its deep dish depth, fork and knife necessity, the 45 minutes it takes to cook. You'd compare it to lovemaking and say, you don't rush delicious things, as you tuck a loose strand of hair behind my ear. I'd rebut with the portability of a slice. I'll take us back to geometry and spit bars about angles and symmetry, present counterpoints about crust to sauce ratio and the science behind semolina flour. All you need is your hands to enjoy the experience, no extra equipment needed. I'd say with a Cheshire, Cheshire cat smile, shall we agree to disagree? How cliche. Let's keep arguing until one of us gives in. This one is actually a prose poem. It ended up becoming a prose poem. You were talking about it. It's called You Have Something of Mine. I lost a white gold, a gold hoop earring in your studio apartment, leaving my left earlobe naked like a 21st century pirate. On the drive home, I wanted to call and say, you have something of mine. I practiced the measure of my tone. Demanding wasn't a word I wanted to hear again, so I softened became someone different as I looked for your number. You didn't even remember me wearing earrings. You have something of mine, I repeated. Are you sure you didn't leave it somewhere else? I left them on your nightstand before we fell asleep. I wear them only with you. You have something of mine. But you denied ever knowing their shape or noticing the way they rested at the middle part of my neck, the part you used to kiss first. I didn't want to argue anymore, so I stopped talking leaving something of mine behind. This uh, one is called Poetry in Non-English with, <laughs> with an epigraph. It's ugly to say that I saw it as normal. Bad Bunny responds to Grammy performance fiasco. And people should know about that, right? Hopefully, got it. My favorite word in Spanish said aggressively sounds like a swear word. Azafata. The other greatest hits are found in telenovelas like Asesino, Lárgate, y te lo suplico. 2014-2017 boyfriend used to love the word enfocar. He'd say it sounded something out of vivid entertainment. Pedro Sosa has always been cuter than lazy. Pedro Sosa is a rascal, tilts his head then smiles when it wants to get away with things. Pero Sosa is the name of a teacup Pomeranian, while lazy is what teachers call the quiet student. Chuchisnaki is the compliment my comadres and I say to ourselves before a night out. Ay que chuchisnaki nos vemos. Dictionaries are useless in a linguistic ecosystem when a sigh and a mirada tells me all I need to know about your day. They are non-English, like our rhythm, clothing, bodies, bochinche, legends, hairstyles, chistes, gritos, orishas, skin tones, never needing subtitles or translation. Um, this last poem is uh, timely. Uh, Hurricane Maria, the uh, anniversary of, of her was last week. Uh, this one's called Aftermath, and this is an epigraph. On September 20th, 2017, Category 5 Hurricane Maria hits Puerto Rico. A Harvard University study estimates 4,645 deaths resulting from Hurricane Maria. Harvard Law School graduate independista Pedro Albizu Campos' war cry, when tyranny is law, revolution is order, whispers over the dead bodies of our gente. Before the colonizers named it Puerto Rico, Tainos called the Borinquen, the land of the valiant lord. Valiant, showing courage and determination. Our heritage, my heirloom, Borinquen and I, nosotros Boricuas. 
1493, Columbus arrived on his second voyage of disease, conquest, and murder. 400 years of forced labor, slave trading, genocide. Spanish, the language of our first colonizer, prevailed. Then English took over. In, 1880, in 1898, we were passed on like property, rebranded in 1952 as a commonwealth, while the Jones Act made us citizens, making us draft possible soldiers without congressional representation. In 1948, Law 53 made the Puerto Rican flag illegal. It would be 10 years before it is repealed. So if you ever wonder why we adorn our cars, bodies, babies, fire escapes with the flag, why we dedicated a whole song to it, why we are so loud, and punctuate our songs, Puerto Rico, bueno ya tu sabes. In 1978, Puerto Rico gave birth to me. In 82, the Bronx raised me. I would return to the island almost every summer with my abuela, who needed to return home as much as she needed me to remember where I came from and who we are, valiente. That is who they were the 4,645 Puerto Ricanos whose bodies are debated against the 64 the federal government claims and the 3.4 million American citizens ignored. You don't scare me, colonizer, with your paper towels, referendums, gag orders, rhetoric. Colonizer, you should be scared. Determination and courage is part of our Taino and Africano DNA. It is in our music, bodies, literature, poesia. It is in this room. We are valiant. Somos Boricuas. Thank you. We have a few minutes for maybe, maybe two questions. Who would like to ask? Yes. Hi, my name is Dominic, I'm mostly from the Bronx, so here. Um, <laughs> but my question kind of goes to is it ever too late to start poetry? Is it ever like, do you ever think about like, maybe? why you started at what you did, and like, like, like how you feel about that kind of now, like where it's, where it's at you. Dominic, are you asking me? I'm asking both. Oh, okay. Sorry, that was the same. You were living on me, so yeah. <laughs> it was like you're telling my story. Um, so you hear I have an endless relationship with literacy, but ain't everything late. So should I tell you? I won't tell you how old I am. I was born in 1966. So uh, I read a lot of poetry, and I would sit on the steps when I was in college and write these poems, which never led to anything. But then I just, all I ever wanted to do was be a fiction writer and a novelist. And so I wrote these three books. But then, you know, in my 50s, I was like, oh, my dream has always been to write a book of poems. So uh, I spent like the last three years writing a book of poems. So I would say, um, Louis Vett and I were talking about this the other night at dinner. It's an odd American thing that we have something, I'm going to generalize real quick. We have something called the Great American Novel, and the Great American Novel is written by a Caucasian man, usually before he turns 25 years old. Because you don't do it before the age of 25, you're wash up. That's like a load of bomb. Um, <laughs> we have lots of examples of writers who come out like in the 50s, or 60s, or Norman McLean wrote The River Runs Through It, and he had published it when he was 72 or 74 years old. So it was a classic book. Who else could write that? So it's never too late, is my answer. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I agree with that. Like, it's, it, it, it's never too late to, to start writing or to, to expand whatever it is you are writing or that write poetry. And, Again, I'm just admitted to starting to write post prose poems like a couple weeks ago, and I was not doing that when I first started 20 something years ago. So I don't think it's ever too late. I mean, artists consistently always say that, right? Like, you know, um, uh, Samuel Jackson didn't get you know his first start until he was like in his way past his mid 40s, um, and you know, uh, you know, a lot of the people that we, we recognize didn't really. Uh, didn't really get their, their, their flowers, shall we say, until much later in life, right? Or they, they didn't have the opportunity because they were raising families, or they had to take care of their family, they were caretakers. So no, I don't think there's ever an expiration date. So no, I don't think it was. <clears throat> Another question? Go for it. I hope this isn't too related, but as kind of a follow-up question um, for both of you, again, I'd love to hear. Um, how, do you, how did you or how do you get over that, the thought of, um, 
of like as like as a creative um, person or as a writer, um, how do you get over the thought of like what if nobody cares essentially? Um, and Freddie brought that up, so I'd love to hear your answer. But believe that as well, please. <coughs> Well, it's, uh, it's hard to answer because um, I, could, I only want to do it from now, like I have some wisdom, which I do now. <laughs> but in fact, that's part of it. Like, uh, when I was really young, I killed so much of my writing and spent lots of years, over 10 years, you know, working on one book because I was just too caught up in the idea of being perfect. And that mm -hmm. perfectionism came from thinking that there were people out there who were going to read it. But then once I step back and realize no one's going to read it unless I own it, what do I want to do? What's important to me? Um, then it really took off. And then, you know, so like I know you take classes and we talk a lot in our class about writing for an audience. It's a huge group of people, like you can speak to everyone here. It's really much smaller than that. I think when you write your first drafts of things, it's sort of like, put a, a sign on your door that says stay out, close the door, put a chair, lock it, nobody comes in. There's no readers, you know, there. And it's just you sort of working on it. My other thing is I keep using the word gift. Um, what if we looked at it in, as Lewis Hyde writes in his book about the gift culture and creativity, in which what we're producing does not have to exist in a marketplace. Because there was a time in which we used to create art and we would share it with each other inside of a community or culture, and then it would circulate around people and have a lot of great value to it. So I'm always thinking about what's the wind make, gifting make when the trees are moving in the wind? What does that gifting make? Why is there a poem in that? And can I just accept that poem and write it? Um, yeah, you can't, I, I got to say, you can't care, honestly. Sometimes like, you, you can have a, you can go to an open mic or you can go read have a reading and two people will show up. Right? Like literally it will be you and this one random person who's having your coffee. <laughs> and that's it. That's who your audience is. Right? And then sometimes it'll be, you know, twenty people or maybe even like more so. Um, if you go into writing, I think thinking about the audience too much, then I think that that's gonna affect the writing. I think that for me at least I don't write initially at least with an audience in mind to be honest i don't think about like who's going to read this i don't think that way i think i start from a very selfish place where this is for me this is for me to process this particular feeling or this memory or this experience whether that experience happened to me directly or it was shared with me from you know from another person and i want to like document that right so I always start from that space, kind of what he said, like you lock the door, and, you know, and it's just with you and your writing. Um, and then for me later on, eventually, it, it, I start thinking about the audience later on. But it's not really the first place I go to. I don't think about who's going to read this because, again, I don't know if that's healthy. <clears throat> for me, it's not healthy to think about to, to think about it that way um, and to think about poetry in this capitalistic way. Mm -hmm. I don't. Again, that's not for me. I know that works for other poets. I know for a fact that works for other poets, where they, they write with the intention of like, I'm going to publish this, it's going to hopefully make me some money, and you know, I'm going to have this and this and that, and that's great, but it's not, the, it's not the life that I prescribe by. And again, I have to think about what's healthy for me, and what's going what's gonna to be good for my soul, what's going to feed me, right? what's going to nourish me. And for me, my work, my work does nourish me. It brings me actual joy. I don't, it doesn't bring me happiness, because happiness is a choice. Joy is very different. It generally brings me joy. It generally nourishes me. I really enjoy these conversations. I, you know, the last couple of years we've been talking about poetry and with, with everyone, and those moments are the things that I'm going to take home to on a plane, because those moments nourish what I do, and I'll probably write about it later. And maybe you'll read about it, maybe not. That's the other choice who you have as a writer. You can write about it and never share it with anybody, and it's just for you. Or, like you said, your community, and that's and that's okay too. You're your own audience, by the way. So when you write for you, you're reading it to yourself. Boom, you got an audience. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.